This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. And welcome to another rousing episode of the Condo Insider. Everything condo, condo ownership, condo management, we talk about it all. I'm your host, Scott Shirley, today, and I'm very pleased to announce that we do have a special guest with us. And doing my research for this particular program, I realized we haven't really touched on base in our condo discussions on one of the very most important things at a condo association, and that's the community manager. So today's episode is going to be on the role of the community manager. And I am pleased to announce that uh, we have somebody I've known for a number of years, even before we started working together. Um, Steve Farrago is our guest today. And would you like to tell everybody what your title is and what you do? Well, I am a community association manager at Associa Hawaii here in Honolulu. I also am a director of management services, meaning there's a team of seven different individuals who work under me that are community managers. And of course, as I said, we've known each other for a number of years, but it was just recently that we realized we've been doing this for about the same amount of time. Yeah, since Captain Cook came. Yeah, I believe that's what it was. <laughs> and, and back then we had uh, this uh, strange thing called paper and pencil that we actually worked with. I sort of remember that. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> so one of the things that we're going to go over today with whatever time we have and that, of course, is the role of a community manager, what they do, what their responsibility is. So first question to you is, does every community association need a community manager? Well, first of all, they have to know what their governing documents state. Mm -hmm. There are some bylaws that require that they must have a professional community or managing agent. Uh, and if so, they indeed must do that. There are a few independent condominium associations, for example, who don't require such an agent, but it's rare. In general, it's a good idea for many reasons. Yeah. Well, and like you said, some don't, and I've discovered over the years, most of those are very small complexes, and they just do what is called self-management. And what they might do on top of that is hire an accountant to do the fiscal side right. of it all. But one issue that's come up, and Richard and I have actually discussed it before in our discussions under 514B, is there is a bit of confusion on the term managing agent. Um, would you like to explain what our statute says in regards to that? Sure. 514B uh, number three states that the managing agent is a person retained as an independent contractor for the purpose of managing the operation of the property. That's the short version of the answer in the statute. So one of the issues that comes up and it's it's People misunderstand that term managing agent. Um, and over the years of teaching courses on condos and things, I've talked about this frequently in that the term manage, managing agent in the statute is actually referring to the management company, not an individual person. But there's a confusion there because they say managing agent, but it really means the company. And so in the company, there's actually people who work under that as the, you can call them account executives. I prefer the term community managers. That just sounds nicer. It does. It's sort of like when I was in radio. I wasn't a DJ. I was an on-air talent. You, know, you still so, are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you had mentioned as well that that's an important understanding under the bylaws as well, is that it'll dictate whether or not you have to hire a managing agent to manage the property. Indeed, besides dictating that, it also, the bylaws also spell out what duties the managing agent can have. Mm -hmm. uh, the board of directors can delegate the responsibility of running the property, which is ultimately theirs. The board's responsible to run the association because they're elected to do so. They can hire agents, one of which is a managing agent who has a real estate license, uh, as a broker and can therefore serve in that function and hire community managers to assist based on what the, by the bylaws allow them to assist with. And of course, clarify it right off the bat, the community manager is not the resident or site manager. That's another one um, or another category of person who's working at the property. Right. So you're hired to do a condominium association. 
what do you do? Well, first of all, again, you have to look back at all the responsibilities that the Board of Directors has in terms of managing the property. Some of those are maintenance related, obviously. So the managing agent can assist with that. Suppose you need a vendor to help fix the fans on the roof. The agent might get proposals from valid licensed vendors to do that, prepare those proposals, give them to the board to assist the board in their selection. There could also be uh, the resident manager that you mentioned. If the board has a manager who just resigned, the community manager might put an ad in the paper or Craigslist or whatever, assist in the interviewing and give the board some names that they can choose from. The responsibility of the community manager are almost infinite, but the board, in conjunction again with the bylaws, determines what the agent does. Yeah. And that aside, one of the other big jobs that you do is attend the board meetings. And Generally speaking, our role as a community manager at a board meeting is not running the meeting. That is the board's duty. What else do you do at the board meeting? Well, first of all, Scott, I'd say that the, what you do at the meeting begins with your preparation for the meeting. <laughs> you better be prepared, right? So every board, there's a board packet, it's called, that goes out. And in that packet, there's a notice to have a valid board regular meeting. The notice must be posted, so you must send that out to the resident manager, say, to post on the bulletin board and to the board members so they have notice of the meeting. Then there's an agenda, there's the minutes yep. of the last meeting, there's the financials for the last month that are going to be reviewed. There's your own report if you have one, a written report, it might be the resident manager's report, a report from the attorney on collections, correspondence from owners, delinquency collection, all the various things that the board needs to discuss, a packet has to be prepared, and then when you come to the meeting, you're prepared to assist them with each of those items. And, you know, one of the other duties, going back to this issue of posting the notice, one of the things we have to do is keep up with what the legislature has done. And Richard and I actually discussed it on a recent show that now the requirement on that meeting notice is you must indicate what is going to be discussed at that meeting. Because, you know, part of the testimony on that particular bill was, well, if I knew the building was going to be painted pink, I would have shown up. And so now they're requiring you to put what's going to be discussed at the meeting so owners can determine themselves whether or not they want to be there to discuss that particular item. I did actually have a, a board owner in a training session say, but if we put what's on there, people will show up. <laughs> well, I think that's the idea. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> well, one of your other roles, at, let's say at the board meeting, is also to remind the board of legal issues, like what the legislature just did and we have to do things differently now, or what the statute says. Correct. You can elucidate on that <laughs> if okay. you want to. But <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, that's a very important point. Uh, for example, a lot of boards in the past might have been reticent to give out documents mm -hmm. to owners, feeling that a doc, an owner might be using that for some nefarious purpose or whatnot, or maybe they're just afraid of them or want to maintain control, which is understandable, yeah. but owners have rights too. That's right. So the legislature changed those requirements of what kind of documents must be made available. So that's an example of something you have to bring to the board's attention that's a change in their thought or the famous assistance animal <laughs> idea that you're so fond of. A lot of people feel, again, some resistance to yeah. that on occasion. So they have to understand what the law requires of them in that regard. And myself, I've attended a number of board meetings with our other community managers on that issue alone. I think I actually attended one with you. You did. And, you know, I might want to bring that point up as well in that not only are you a community manager, you are a condo owner yourself, and you serve on the board of your own condominium association. I do. You would think I knew better. Yeah, not to exactly. Well, I, I have to admit that I did a role of president on my condo association for two years. And again, I knew better. <laughs> and that's why I created for board members the 12-step program to get out of that. So we'll talk later. <laughs> All right. I'm sure I could use it. Now, there has been a lot of 
concern coming up legislatively wise, even discussion at the Real Estate Commission in regards to are these people who do association management, are they trained? Do they need to be licensed? And that's been actually bubbling to the surface for the last few years. And I know the people you and I work with um, are actually very well trained. Can you explain where they can get some of this training? Well, there's various sources of, of training. Certainly there are certain kinds of classes people take, even in classical education, such as accounting, business management, things like that that are of great use to people. Uh, at the same time, specific type of training for our industry often comes from the professional organizations, such as Community Association Institute, IRAM, Yes. The Institute of Real Estate Management, HCCA, Hawaii Community, <laughs> Hawaii Council of Community Associations. Yeah. All these organizations offer seminars, classes, that, and publications or online uh, publications that can be of assistance to the manager to become more educated in what, what we do. Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of these also have designations that go along with them. So it's not just going in for a day seminar and boom, you've got the training. Some of them require you to go to multiple training sessions. And once you've completed that and passed exams, you actually get a designation related to what you are doing. What are some of those? Well, for example, CAI, its first basic uh, designation is for a community association specialist, basically, CMCA it's called. And then there's AMS, but the most famous one is PCAM, or Professional Community Association Manager. It's quite an arduous type of undertaking where you take about 10 different courses, yeah. and then you do a case study at a property that's quite detailed in terms of the analysis of all aspects of running an association. And then if you pass, luckily, then you become a PCAM. And we do have a number in our office that have the PCAM designation. And not only do they take that education, but in order to continue to have that designation, they have to continue education as well. Just like the realtors have continuing educations that they're mandated to do every two years. So we're, it's not, people just walking in off the street and say, I want to do this for a living. True. Actually, I'm not sure how many people actually wake up and say, I want to do this for a living. Didn't you think that when you were a child? Uh, I was told what I was going to ah. do for a living. And that's why I do this. I don't know anything else. But, <laughs> you know, another issue that comes up, and I've been very aware of it, and we will talk more about it in just a minute, is the idea that community managers must be licensed like real estate agents. And that has been an issue, especially for the last two or three years, that has been discussed at great length. And we'll talk about that a little more when we come back from our short break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Ted Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything you, to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck. Welcome back to the Condo Insider, everything about condos you ever wanted to know. And again, our guest today is um, Steve Farrago, who is a professional community manager. And before we went to break, we were just discussing this issue of licensing. 
And so just as a little background that you're aware of, but our audience may not be, is a couple times there has been attempts to require a community manager to get a real estate license. The first attempt was going to require anybody who works at a management company have a broker's license, which when you think about it, the person who answers the phone and that's all <laughs> they do now has to have a broker's license and things like that. It didn't make sense. Plus, you have to get one license first before you get a real estate uh, broker's license. You have to go through a period of time with a sales license first. Then we also have to realize the fact that what you and I do in community management is completely different than what happens with the typical real estate agent. So this issue has been coming up and you and I and Richard Emery have had this discussion and that is what would be a better way to handle the situation because we're getting the education, we're getting certification, why not just register everybody? What do you think of that? Well, I think that's a good idea. Um, certainly one of the great things about our industry is that a person can bring a variety of expertise mm -hmm. to the industry so that they're not just uh, this or that or the other. Uh, the idea, though, of being registered would be a, a way to keep track of all the people who are doing this particular job and their notification information and whatnot. I think it's a good idea. Well, and as you briefly mentioned at the beginning of the show, the requirements under statute for a management company is there must be a principal broker. Right. But beyond that, the people who are actually going out and sitting in board meetings, helping with the minutes, advising the boards, do not have to be licensed. In our case, most of our people are very well educated and have certifications as well. So this is a tough business to be in. And just to give you an example, this morning I got contacted by one of our community managers that he thought that the owner was being unreasonable, wanting to know right then and there on the phone call, where is the water line and exactly how many feet is it from my sink? And why don't you know that? I don't know why he didn't know that. <laughs> so in the mood I was in today, I commented back that, um, oh, that's nothing. I had an owner call me up during Hurricane Isel to complain that the gutters weren't working right. You know, it was a hurricane. I don't think they were designed to accommodate the water from a hurricane, but that's just an example of what we deal with on a daily basis. What, what can you add in the regards to tough business? Well, it reminds me of my very first experience, my first day on the job. My boss sent me out to my new property and I'm walking around with great pride and in inspecting. And this gentleman comes out and he says, please, can you help me? And I said, how can I assist you? He said, my toilet's clogged. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you come and fix it? I said, no, no, that's not what I do. Uh, I tried to explain to him, well, what do I pay you these fees for? You should come in and fix my toilet. So I went back to my boss and he explained. <laughs> these are the kind of questions you'll get, but no, we don't clean toilets. Uh, I mean, it feels that way sometimes, but no, that's not part of what we do. And uh, the other big misconception, I think, is we just work an eight-hour day. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there is such a thing as an eight-hour day in this business. No, it's one of the things <coughs> about the business for sure. Most community managers put in a full eight-hour day in the office, maybe going out to properties during the day as well. And as often as not, they have meetings at night. Yep. I have a meeting tonight myself, for example. So you drive to all parts of the island or a neighbor island even perhaps, and you go to a board meeting, some of which are several hours long, as you know, that's why you prefer that five-hour energy drink. <laughs> so you might be there for many, many hours, and then the next day you've still got many other things to attend to. Well, you and I come from a period of time where if we had to do something, we picked up the phone and called that person. Well, that doesn't work that way anymore. And so a lot of things we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis is just an overload of emails. And I don't know what you can say to that, but I know some of our community managers say, oh, I average between 170 and 300 emails a day. <laughs> that's, that's about right, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, I do pine for the good old days of just a telephone, maybe a pager. You sort of did have a life afterwards. Can you even remember when you got a letter in the mail? Imagine that. Oh, yeah, and really? You open the letter and you would read it. 
you had a day or two to write a response and get it in the mail, and that's predominantly how you communicate. Yeah. Well, I still get comments <laughs> because I came from a generation where you actually sat down and wrote a thank you note, not a thank you email, but a note. And I had somebody call me, goes, I've never gotten one of these before, a <laughs> handwritten note. So our industry is changing, and part of that is there's a lot of common misconceptions as to what we do. Um, as you pointed out, you don't go and unclog toilets, generally. <laughs> what other kind of misconceptions do you think we get saddled with? Well, I think lots of people think that the community association manager, again, dictates to the board, or depending on their axe to grind, ought to dictate to the board <laughs> exactly how things are to be done but they don't understand that we're just an agent, we're just an advisor. You can lead a horse to water, but you can make him drink, as the old saying goes. So the conception that the things that the board does, we're responsible for, and we should have made them do something else, yeah. is not the case. Well, it's how many times have you and I and other people have dealt with the, you raised my maintenance fees. Right. Well, no, we don't. Or your manager was mean to me. <laughs> like, I don't have a manager. <laughs> but this idea that we're responsible for raising that maintenance fee, no, it's based on the budget that the board approves. And that's what raises or lowers, I, although I've never seen a lowered maintenance fee. I heard of it once. Once? Yeah, I think maybe <laughs> once. And suddenly we're to blame. We're the ones getting the nasty phone calls or the nasty emails. Like when you write the violation letter about their dog barking or some hugely uh, annoying thing that's going on on the property. It's, it's all your fault that you wrote this to them. Well, my favorite in <laughs> regards to violations is the response sometimes we get back. So we send them a notice about their dog barking or not picking up after your animal. And usually it comes back, well, why am I getting this when the other people aren't? Well, the key there is, is how do you know the other people aren't? <laughs> you know, we don't, their mail? <laughs> I told one owner, we don't put a poster board up in the lobby that says, these are the people who got violation notices this week. <laughs> so just because you got one, don't assume nobody else didn't get one too for whatever their violation was. Right. Um, so we do this. There are misconceptions about what we do, but there's also a misunderstanding about the different types of services that we may do as well. True. There, we already talked about that there are a few self-managed yeah. properties, but even then a board of directors has a menu basically of choices in terms of how they engage a managing agent, mm -hmm. right? Fiscal, you mentioned earlier, is basically you collect money and pay the bills, uh, keep the books. That's about it with fiscal management. There's various levels of what we call full management yep. as well. Some management companies, including the one we work for at Associate Y, actually are able to assist further by providing uh, staff, like for maintenance, mm -hmm. resident manager, things like that. So whatever services a management company provides, that's what determines the level of, of the contract. And as you know, I just recently finished up a three-week program on training of resident and site managers at the office. And it made me realize maybe our job isn't that bad when you consider what happens with the resident manager, who's on property in some cases 24-7. So yes, we can drown our sorrows with each other, but then we have to think of the poor resident manager as well. Um, so. Before we end up our program today, one of the things is asking you what you think a good community manager should be. Well, it's pretty amazing that a good community manager needs a large variety of skills. And part of that, I would be, I think, not uh, doing justice to the community manager role if I didn't talk briefly about the great advantages of such a job. I mean, that you get to meet so many different kinds of people in society. Uh, you get to meet very many types of vendors and people in politics. And you have a range of people that you meet that you don't often have in a, in a normal kind of job. So that's a tremendous benefit. And so you have to like to meet people. You have to <laughs> like people. <laughs> so if you're the guy who refuse, doesn't like people at all, this is not the kind of job for you because you're going to deal with a lot of people and you need to have a, a sense of good customer service, patience, good listening skills, 
handle adversity and uh, the anger yeah. that might come at you well and understand most people are not really personally attacking you. They're frustrated. Yeah. And if you can figure a way to assist them, that's a good thing. You have, need to have common sense. Uh, be a down-to-earth kind of person and uh, tolerate uncertainty because lots of times owners are asking you what's being decided, what's happening. It's a process many times that takes weeks or months and so you have to be able to tolerate that. You have to be good with deadlines and have good verbal and written communication skills. A positive view and strong personality assist as well. I think a good demeanor like yourself does real well in this business. Thank you. Well, we didn't get to go over everything, which is not untypical of this program. Um, but I, again, would like to thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to thank everybody who joined us here today on the Condo Insider in the role of a community manager. And be sure to tune in next Thursday for everything you never or ever wanted to know uh, about condominium living here on the Condo Insider.